Good afternoon. My name is Mehdi Saram. I'm a nuclear engineer, University of Michigan, 1967. And I'm here to talk about my lifetime experience with the American Nuclear Society. We made that nuclear reactor for the first time in Iran, critical and operational. Good afternoon. My name is Mehdi Saram. I'm a nuclear engineer, graduate of the University of Michigan, 1967. But we need to go back and figure out how I made it to Michigan. Originally, I'm from Iran. Uh, after graduating from the Jordan College, uh, established by Dr. Jordan, an American, uh, I came to America at the age of 18, and I started my nuclear engineering studies at the University of Michigan. That was during President Kennedy time. Shortly after, I became a nuclear reactor operator, got my license from U.S. Atomic Energy Commission, and starting in 1963, I was a still a student, a full-time foreign student, I joined the American Nuclear Society. And if we count today, 2023, it is 60 years that I've been a loyal, full-time member of this wonderful great society called the American Nuclear Society. There are a few other maybe pictures I can show. I'm proud of this one. This is yours truly, uh, November, oh, I forget, 1963 at the two megawatt research reactor, University of Michigan. I just want you to know this, the slide rule. We had no iPhones. We had, we had no calculator. We had these cranking machines. This is how we became nuclear engineers. And today the students think, well, where is my iPhone? Uh, we did a lot of things manually, and we graduated, and we are successful. I was the only foreign student at the University of Michigan. Full-time student, taking 19 units, and working full-time. Day shift, afternoon shift, night shift. And I was making $600 a month then. Okay, these are my privileges. They said, the board of university, you can't do this. I said, well, if I don't make my grades, then I'll, I'll, I won't work. So for five years, you're talking to a guy, night shift, I would have my sandwich, eight o'clock, I had a car, beautiful car, British. Take a nine o'clock class, 10 o'clock, go afternoon, crash, sleep, and I was a National Science Foundation scholarship all those years. My dad gave me $600, a Pan Am prop plane ticket, stopped in Istanbul, London, to come to New York. This is how planes were. Now, you guys have no idea how we lived. Uh, going back to Michigan, I uh, finished my studies, and uh, I guess like a good boy, I went back home. I must say, I was the first, forgot to say, I was the first nuclear engineer who arrived in Iran with a nuclear reactor license in 1967. Today there are thousands, uh, many of them in America too. Uh, so I went back to Tehran, late 1967, not knowing that America, during President Eisenhower time, under the program called Adam for Peace, had given a five megawatt research reactor, only for research, not power, to Pakistan, Iran, and Turkey. And since I was a licensed nuclear reactor operator at the University of Michigan, a little smaller size, two megawatt, uh, I started teaching at the Tehran University, where the five megawatt nuclear reactor was. And uh, I was a little concerned being alone. Uh, 
all by myself and I had to train some staff. And we made that nuclear reactor for the first time in Iran, critical and operational to five megawatt on November 11th, 1967. That's a long time ago. I was uh, like 25 years old. They said the Americans supplied five megawatt research reactor. Believe it or not, it was vacuum tube. There were no digital, there were no transistors at that time. And the two colleagues, one German, one French educated, uh, are helping me. And you notice they all have their slider. Actually, I'm withdrawing the control rod, slowly calculating the doubling time to make the reactor critical. And we use highly enriched uranium, 93%, uh, 5.1 kilograms of it. The reason I said I was concerned is in America, as a shift supervisor at Michigan Nuclear Reactor, I had a couple of Americans working for me, and so we had the support of the system and the staff. But we made it, uh, and it was supervised by the International Atomic Energy Agency consultants. This is November 11, it's the late Shah of Iran and the Queen and all the ministers uh, in the control room of the Americans supplied five megawatt research reactor. We talked about this under Eisenhower, Adam for Peace, Iran uh, received, we paid for it, a million dollars. And the reactor, by the way, was designed by a famous American company <laughs> called AMF, American Machine and Foundry. And believe it or not, they make bowling alleys and they also make nuclear reactors. Uh, they made, uh, they, they uh, designed and built many reactors in other countries as well. This is me, age 25, sitting on the reactor plenum of the Tehran University with all my keys here. Uh, the nuclear reactor sets the core in a pool of like 100,000 gallons uh, of water, distilled water. Uh, so it acts as shielding. There's no water, there's no nuclear fuel. I'm sitting on what we call the plenum of the reactor, and this is a little better. I'm standing on it. The holes there, the actual MTR fuel elements, about three feet tall, three inches on each side, uh, with enriched uranium in it, we load one at a time, and we do calculations until we decide the reactor went critical. All the nuclear students listening, you all know what I'm talking about. K effective has to be one, critical. And then we increase the power to one kilowatt. It took a few days before we reached the five megawatt. It's like any nuclear power plant, AP 1000. You just cannot go to 1000 or 3000 thermal. You have to go slowly, do all the tests, check the pressure system, the, the, there's no leakage. So I continued my work at the Tehran University Nuclear Center. Then the Shah decided sometimes in early 70s that he wanted a large number of nuclear commercial plants for production of electricity. And people in Iran, this is like in the 70s, wondering with all the oil and gas that Iran has, number two, three producer in the world, why would he need nuclear power plant? I've met him a number of times, and, and I guess what I discovered was he had a vision for the country, for Iran, that eventually uh, Iran would run out of gas and, and oil and so it's best to train people, because the lead time for a nuclear industry is about 20, 30 years. Any country uh, that wants to start nuclear power program needs about 20, 30 years uh, to train people, to have the right infrastructure, to have the right scientists. So uh, he established uh, an organization called Atomic Energy Organization of Iran. And I resigned from Tehran University. I was an assistant professor. People were surprised, but they, I said, I have to go where the nuclear center goes. 
So Dr. Etemad, who is still with us in Paris, age 93, he was a reactor physicist from uh, Switzerland and Saclay in France, and he was the president and essentially would report to the Shah of Iran. Uh, his title was deputy prime minister. So I knew him from early days, and I joined him as one of the first few people. So I worked there until 1979, and we were building uh, on, with Germans, uh, Siemens, or Kraftwerk Union. We came to America to get Westinghouse plans, but politics of uh, Jimmy Carter didn't allow that, and Gerald Ford was for it, but anyways. So the Shah decided to go to Germany, and uh, we purchased two nuclear plants, large, american size, like Seabrook 1200 megawatt electric each. Cost at that time was over four and a half billion dollars. Uh, sadly, they were never finished because the revolution, the regime change in Iran, Shah had to leave the country in 79, and uh, the plants were just left over, and the regime had decided they just don't want nuclear power plant. And then they changed their mind, <laughs> like all politicians, and later on restarted it with the Russians program. So here's a German design, American design nuclear plant, large size, had to be reconverted to VVR 1100 Russian design. So that took another 10, 15 years. Uh, so the Boucher plant at the Persian Gulf, uh, so 1200, now 1100 megawatt, is probably the most expensive plant in the world because it took 35 years. Originally it was supposed to be on line 19 in five years, let's say 1979-80. Uh, so that's the story of Iran. They still have one operating. It's the only country besides India and Pakistan in the whole region. Israel doesn't have it. Saudi Arabia doesn't have it. UAE, I guess, copied Iran, and then they decided to build a number of plants with uh, South Korea. Now I'll come to that because I work in that project. They said the Shah should come to the reactor when the reactor on his birthday. I said, no, 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 I'm not ready. He comes when I tell him to come. He said, you're going to go to jail. You can't overrule the Shah. He said, I did, and it worked. The Shah came on November 11th when I told the Ministry of Court. Shah wanted all the dignitaries of the world, regardless of who they are, and I'm not political, I'm a scientist. This is Marshal Tito of Yugoslavia, yes. Yugoslavia. A long time ago, there was a country called Yugoslavia, and then there are 16 nations <laughs> partitioned with lots of problems. A uh, heavy duty guy, and, and I was privileged to be his host. Uh, he would come to the control room and, and uh, look around in wonderful English. This is another person, uh, president of uh, Romania. Uh, the floor was uh, slightly contaminated, and I, as the captain, the, the supervisor of the reactor, decided that they should wear shoe covers. And it was hard at that time to convince uh, government officials, Iranian, that the president should wear. They finally did it. Like when you become a nuclear reactor operator or supervisor, you're captain of the ship. You make decisions and you do it. This is one of the nuclear weapon designers that crossed in India. I went, I don't want to talk about this. It was a state visit in India, 1975. State visit, we went to see Mrs. Gandhi and uh, took us to the Rajasthan site where they blew nuclear weapon. Uh, you see this, sir? Mm -hmm. uh, Atomic Energy Organization of Iran, sponsored by American Nuclear Society, by European Nuclear Society, and Japan Atomic Energy Society. Uh, this conference was held April 10 to 17 in Persepolis, Iran. This is the royal tent. Uh, 
and the Prime Minister is there, and I am opening the conference. I was 35 years old uh, when this happened. Joe Dietrich, Vice Chair of American Nuclear Society, Dr. Etamad, my boss, 500 people are sitting, and Octave is sitting in front. Uh, this is Chairman of IAEA who hired me, we are now Dr. Eklund. This is Munir Ahmad Khan, the nuclear weapon designer in Pakistan. Uh, I'm the chairman. Next to it, Angie Giambuso, I believe he's passed away. He was uh, Deputy Secretary, Department of Energy. And next to him is Jay de Villiers, South Africa. He was in charge of their nuclear program or weapon program. And next to it, I know well, uh, Dr. Ramana from India, uh, head of Baba Atomic Research Center. I've been to India a number of times. Uh, he was also in charge of their program. I show this to people. This is Iran. The women, these are the class women, or average secretaries are my staff. That's me, Royal Tent. People in America think, I'm sorry, or in Tennessee or Chicago, that Iranian women are like Arabs in, in Chador and, and, and Burqa. This is the queen of Iran, still alive, 83 in Connecticut and Paris. She wrote it for me. I'm not pro Shah, but she happened to know me. Ken Hansen, chairman of nuclear engineering, MIT, me in, in Boston, Africa. He came to Iran, Etamad, I was in charge of training too. We gave him $10 million to train 30 Iranian students at MIT. Two of the students died, three went back. Six of those students were my students. They're doing top secret Pentagon work in Pentagon. I can't even tell you their names. These are things we've done. We gave $10 million to MIT to establish a new school, to train 30, and I interviewed. He came to Tehran. He sat with me, said, no, no. I said, yes, yes. So we chose, I overruled them. I said, these are the students going to MIT. When I joined ANS as a student in 1963 at the University of Michigan, I was like 21 years old. But I'm becoming a nuclear engineer, so I figured it's the right thing to do to join this professional society. It was fairly small uh, at that time, and it has grown. But what most people don't know, over 60 years of my membership with this amazing organization is the role it has played in the world. For example, in 1968, and I talked about it when I went back to Iran, Octave du Temple was the EDO, Executive Director of Operation. He came there and we talked and we established the Iranian section in Tehran University called American Nuclear Society. Today, there are tens, hundreds of chapters around the world, in Korea, I'm sure in China, in, in Africa, in Europe. European have their own European Nuclear Society, but there are tens of my European friends who are also members of American Nuclear Society. And they come to our winter summer conferences, as I have always attended, to present papers and participate and contribute. This is a little bit about this. And Octave du Temple, I have stories when he came to the Persepolis conference. Octave had this little black briefcase and it was like jokingly secret and we offered them to buy him a Persian leather briefcase and he would refuse, said, no, 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 I gotta have it. Octave has had a lot to do with the success of American Nuclear Society and, and Others have followed, others have done even a better job to this date. Uh, I'm just part of this society to the day that I'm around. Uh, maybe we'll celebrate uh, my 65th year membership, who knows. So in general, America was the lead in nuclear power technology. We as America, not me, we taught the world about nuclear power, light water reactor technology. Uh, they copied, they did a good job. Our government, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, its predecessor was the Atomic Energy Commission until 75. Uh, the rules and regulations that we have are the highest standard to the point that the Koreans, South Koreans, use NRC standards for 
licensing design certification when they sold four nuclear plants, 1,400 megawatt each, larger than any American nuclear power plant. That's South Korea, a demolished country. They learned from us, they did a good job. France, 50 plus nuclear plants, Germany. Essentially, all the light water reactors in the world, including the one in Iran at Boucher, it was a German design based on American design, eventually became a Russian design after the problems, uh, uh, the change of regime. So ANS, <coughs> we have IEEE, we have ASME, we have many of these professional societies in America. But to me, and I'm not biased, I have observed for 60 years the role that it has played uh, from Octave du Temple, from Vince Boyer, Vice President of Philadelphia Electric, uh, to Joe Henry, to, to all these wonderful people, the current president, the past president, the EDOs, they come and go. Uh, American Nuclear Society is, is really like a leader to teach, train, guide, mentor why we need nuclear power, why we need students to pursue nuclear technology because it's the best way to fight climate change. We should use more renewable energy and nuclear power, and the world is. The world is going to build 400 plus nuclear plants. Sadly, only two or maybe four of them are in America. It's politics, it's nuclear waste issues, but the rest of the world, UAE with all that oil, is just put the third nuclear plant online and the fourth one soon. Uh, others are following. So nuclear power is good. People just need to know it's not only a good, safe, secure job and a position, but you're contributing to improve the world climate. We should not burn coal or oil. We have to because we don't have electricity. Uh, so what happened is around 19... 80, 81, I decided, well, there's no job, there's no future, I might as well leave. So where, where, where would I come? Back to America where I got educated. Uh, but in between, uh, I worked for the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna, part of United Nations as with the Department of Inspection. That was a good one year stepping stone and then in January 1982, I came to Philadelphia to work for United Engineers, which was one of the subsidiaries of Raytheon. So this is the civilian side of Raytheon. And uh, I worked there for almost of 18 years, close to 18. I became a U.S. citizen in 1988. We went through the legal process starting with H-1 work visa in 82. Then, because some of my work became classified type, uh, Raytheon sponsored me and I obtained my high level, what we call Q, as the letter Q clearance with the partner energy. And I had that uh, for about eight, nine years, and then my work changed and so they put that on hold. So I had that privilege to work on some of these projects for DOE, nuclear waste and others. See, I have to now remember what happened then. Uh, yeah, uh, sometime in 1994, Raytheon assigned me to Nuclear Energy Institute right here in Washington, D.C., where I am today, a uh, great organization that supports the industry. NEI supports the nuclear industry. Our 100 plus nuclear plants now down to 92. Sadly, uh, we need to build more nuclear power plants as, as we need it. Uh, so three years there and, you know, I changed jobs again. And uh, I worked for one year at Millstone Nuclear Station in Connecticut. It was a good experience uh, all these years. I had been a member of the American Nuclear Society. Actually, while in Philadelphia in the 80s, I joined the American Nuclear Society Delaware Valley section, 
I became the vice president, I became the chairman of local section, and we got two awards from National ANS for the most improved section and for the best program. We, we were recognized among all the sections in the country. And I guess I had something to do with it. Uh, anywhere I went, I joined the local section, American Nuclear Society. Then there came time and opportunity to go to Toronto, Canada, and people wondered, why are you going there? And I figured, well, it's there, why not? Uh, Duke Energy opened up an office in Toronto, and I became the office manager. People thought I'd go there for one year, and it turned out to be a wonderful eight-year assignment from 1998 to 2006. Later, Areva, this huge French company, originally named Framatom, Framatom became Areva, uh, purchased Duke Engineering, Duke, not Duke Energy, Duke Engineering. And so I worked for them as a regional manager in Toronto, Canada, and we started from zero and made a massive project hiring hundreds of people. We were providing for the first time uh, nuclear services to can-do nuclear plants. Canadians don't have light water reactors. They use heavy water and natural uranium. We use three, four percent enriched uranium and regular natural water. So we learned a lot. It's all the experience and still a member of ANS would come to local ANS meeting. Uh, to the extent possible. And I forgot to say, even when I was in Iran in those 15 years, I used to come to San Francisco or Washington, D.C. for winter summer meetings of ANS, and I was a member of code committee. So we were very active with ANS, literally became, was, is, and will be my home. It's, it's part of my life. It's 60 years, 63, 1963 to 2020. And uh, I claim there are not too many people alive <laughs> who have been a member of National ANS uh, for 60 years. It's an honor for me. It's a privilege. My assignment in Toronto by choice, I went there by choice, came back by choice, worked in Boston, Massachusetts for about two more years. Then after 50 years of work, I guess I got burnt a little bit, and uh, I decided to call it quits. And, and I retired. Drove across the country and ended up in Carlsbad, California. And the first thing I did is to join the local San Diego section of ANS. I was on the board. Uh, I started teaching, lecturing, uh, to this date, 15 years in so-called retirement. Uh, I've been as active, if not more active, than I was working full-time in Philadelphia or Canada. Uh, so we would teach at local universities, colleges, encourage the students to become nuclear engineers, pursue not just nuclear, mechanical, civil, electrical, because the nuclear power plant design needs all disciplines. It needs even structural engineers. Pursue, and you'll have a good job with the nuclear industry. Uh, in 2012, the former company, Raytheon URS, called me, said, we have a job for you in South Korea. I said, well, look, I'm retired. I'm 72, 70 or 72. They said, no, you got to go. So I did. So I spent one whole year in Seoul, South Korea, as advisor to KEPCO, KHNP. They're part of government. Uh, they're not private. As advisor for licensing of their 1,400 megawatt, believe it or not, Koreans have 1,400 megawatt. We don't have it in America. They took it from us and they added 200 megawatt. Uh, so I was working on a project for United Arab Emirates uh, to sell them four 1,400 megawatt PWR, Westinghouse design. They got better than us. Uh, probably over $25 billion project. Three of those units are operating in Abu Dhabi in UAE. Amazing. So 
I guess they're the first Arab nation with nuclear power, which is great. So I went to UAE a couple of times, Dubai, tried to do some training for their operators, because I'm basically a nuclear reactor operator, uh, and also teaching, lecturing. Uh, so one year, one year there, we helped KEPCO on a daily basis, train them, teach them to get the license from USNRC. There was one condition UAE would say to, to uh, South Korea, we're not going to buy your plant unless the U.S. government, NRC, Regulatory Commission, certifies your design. This is the importance of our U.S. NRC. The two other countries say, we got to design it according to U.S. standards, not Korean standards, not UAE standards. And eventually they got the design certification, only cost like a few hundred million dollars in six years. <laughs> that's, that's what it takes to build a nuclear power plant. So that was one really achievement uh, after retirement. It was 15 years I had retired or something. They called me back and it was a privilege to work for the same company after I had retired 15 years. What else did I do there? Uh, I went to Vienna, Austria. Uh, it was a confidential project to work on the design of security system for what we call a new measurement lab. Uh, part of Safeguards division is they take samples, dust, air from various countries. The job of IAEA Safeguards is to make sure countries don't build nuclear weapons if they've signed NPT. And of course, India, Pakistan, Israel are not part of NPT. Iran was, I forgot to say. In 1968, I was happy to be part of the team to convince the government that we should sign non-proliferation treaty. Iran never needed nuclear weapons then, now, or future. And then what these people are doing is besides the point. They didn't ask me. Otherwise, I would tell them Iran really doesn't need nuclear power plant. Israel has it, has always had it. So does India, so does Pakistan. Uh, another, uh, so that was a wonderful assignment in Vienna, Austria. Uh, many countries participated, and the cost of that NML was about $150 million. Today is working, and I'm happy to say it was part of it. So as you see, I'm, I'm part of many projects, even after retirement. To a nuclear guy, retirement doesn't mean anything. You keep working, working. And today I'm 81 years old. <laughs> I've had the privilege of visiting, going to 38 countries. My homeland is, of course, one of them. I work in actually 10 of them, like Korea. We work in Russia. We work in some other countries. Uh, It, that by itself is a privilege, you know, Canada, work eight years. Uh, I have friends in all these countries. We are, it's funny, the world nuclear community is a small, yet it's large. I have nuclear friends in Japan, China, Russia. You know, I don't care about the governments. Russian nuclear scientists are as good as Chinese nuclear scientists or American nuclear scientists. So, I guess in all, I consider myself a little less privileged, whatever it is, lucky that I am not only academic professor of nuclear engineering science, but I'm also familiar with the operation side of nuclear plants or facilities or research facilities. I'm not sure if I mentioned that I had U.S. government Q clearance. I think we talked about that. That also gave me knowledge about nuclear facilities which are not commercial. And since they're classified, we cannot talk about them. Uh, we are loyal people and, and we don't, my family doesn't know some of the countries I've been to and, and it's, it's that serious. I'm a very proud American and, and this country has given me a lot. So we are trying to We've been trying to give something back. My children are 51 and 48, three grandchildren. Uh, 
your average middle class people, because my aim was never money. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have become a medical doctor. And there, there's a beauty in what I've done. So I, I really want to say this. When I talk to my students, I tell them, I look at the mirror, me, every morning, and I say, Mehdi, my name is Mehdi. What would you do if you go back to 1960 and you're a student at Michigan or anywhere? Would you do anything differently? The answer is no. I still would become a nuclear engineer. I still would do what I've done because I have no regrets. And that's the concept of being happy, not materialistic. It's a joy to be here, and I really thank Mr. Craig Piercy for giving me this opportunity, and you, sir, Mr. Uh, Smith. Uh, my home is now San Diego, Carlsbad. Eventually, I'll go back. But I have two more lectures. I teach at Cal State University nuclear power every semester. I taught at Miracosta College one year. We were training operators one full semester. Sadly, Edison decided to shut down San Ofri. I'm training operators for Edison, and they shut it down in 2013. So this is it. And uh, if there's more information you need, I'll be happy to talk to you. Thank you, Maddie. Thank you very much.